All right, so we are still on the topic of radiation uh, biophysics, and now we're going to start covering uh, some uh, more advanced ideas. Again, we're using some of the ideas presented in the presentation by uh, Peter uh, from the University of Denver. So thank you, Professor Peter. So let's get started. <clears throat> ideas of indirect effect of radiation. So far, we've discussed direct effects. Direct is when radiation hits the molecule either in a radiosensitive volume or double strand breaks and uh, inactivates it. Now we're going to talk about indirect effects, which is essentially the formation of radicals in aqueous solutions. Explanation follows. And we're also going to discuss different factors that would also influence radiation sensitivity that we have not discussed yet. So let's get started. What is indirect effect of radiation? And this nice depiction uh, taken from the lecture slides basically show uh, my target or my molecule of interest. I have my two molecules of interest here, and they're swimming happily in aqueous solution, H2Os. And it just so happens that tissues in our bodies are in aqueous solutions. So this does does depict something that we would expect in uh, everyday uh, lives, so to speak. Now, we already discussed the direct effect of radiation would be if I have some sort, some sort of radiation that comes in contact directly with my DNA or radiosensitive uh, volume and renders it inactive. But it just so happens that radiation can interact fairly well with water molecules. And what is the impact that radiation may have on water molecules? Well, let's consider this. If I have, if I have my H2O right here, and it is hit with a form of ionizing radiation, I can, in fact, be observing a formation of radicals. And radicals are a highly reactive species of molecules due to unpaired electrons in their orbitals. And this is something that is more chemistry related, but it's important to understand. And the radicals that I can observe is either um, a hydrogen radical or, uh, or an OH highly reactive radical. Also, I can, I can have uh, an H2O2, which isn't really a radical, but it's again a highly reactive uh, species. And all of these guys, if they're created, we already mentioned that these radicals, what they do is they they have an unpaired electron and they seek out other molecules around them to grab an electron from. And if they're grabbing electron from other molecules, they are ionizing them and effectively they are destroying them. So what happens if I have, let's just say, I have a very massive, uh, massive ionizing radiation here. This is a massive ionizing radiation, and, and it hits this, let's just say, this um, oxygen molecule, and it renders it into a radical. I'm just going to, to mark it in red. This is now a radical. This is now a radical. doesn't really matter which radical, but it is a radical. And that radical is now going to interact with my molecule, grab an electron, and ionize it, and it can cause inactivation. So now effectively, let's consider what happened here. What happened here is that I hit with my, I hit with my energy uh, in, a, in a place or rather in a volume that is around my molecule, not directly within my molecule, and I caused inactivation. And es essentially that means that in dilute aqueous solutions, I can, I can miss the molecule but still cause inactivation. And this is basically indirect effect. That means that you can think about it instead of hitting this molecule here, I can still inactivate it if I hit it, let's just say, around here. And in this, and in this, uh, in this respect, you can think of it as the target, the target gets bigger. Target gets bigger. Gets bigger. Because I can effectively, I can effectively hit molecules around my molecule of interest, and those molecules are going to form into radicals, and those radicals will end up destroying perhaps my molecule. And that is the indirect effect of radiation. So whenever I'm going to be in, in aqueous or in dilute aqueous solutions, I can expect to have more radiation sensitivity. And that is very well portrayed in this graph, also taken from the lecture slides as well. A very nice graph saying, hey, look, What's going on here is that this, this curve represents a dried sample. Let's consider what is going on. This is my fraction of surviving organisms. The further I am up the y-scale, 
the less uh, inactivated molecule as I have. And the further right on the x-axis I am, the more radiation I'm applying. So take a look at this. I'm applying plenty of radiation at this point. I'm applying a lot of radiation and still I'm not experiencing a lot of drop as far as percentage. We can have like 20% um, inactiv inactivated molecule at almost 120 gray, which is a lot of a lot of of, of um, a lot of dose. But what really happens here is that if we have uh, our molecules of interest in dilute aqueous solution, I can already see a uh, hundred percent inactivation at where are we at around maybe five gray some along these lines. So this shows you that you can dramatically increase radiation sensitivity by placing your sample in aqueous solutions. And just a reminder, our bodies are indeed aqueous solutions. So this is the indirect effect of uh, radiation. We're going to keep on trucking and we're going to start touching on factors that influence radiation sensitivity. And we already discussed uh, the radiation quality. We discussed the let, which is the linear energy transfer, aka ionization density. Ionization density, perfect. And we also discussed penetrability. Penetrability. And these two really go into the weighing factor, the weighing factor of radiation that we place into the um, the effective and uh, the effective dose concepts the biological co dose concepts that we reviewed in the last video. But there's another concept that I would like to discuss, and that's the relative, relative, biological, relative biological effectiveness. What does that mean? Well, basically, I have a way of saying, hey, let's, let's see how, how high quality my radiation is, and I'm going to compare it to standard radiation, and my standardized radiation will be a 250 kilo electron volt x-ray. And how am I going to do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate my RBE, my relative biological effectiveness, and I'm going to place here the dose of the uh, x-ray of 250 kilo electric volts, this is a standardized x-ray, over the dose of my test radiation that would cause the same damage. And what do I mean? Let's just say I have a person here, and this is totally ridiculous, but it is a fun thing to think about. Let's just say I have, I know my 250 kilo electron volt x-ray really well. I know what its implications are. And I'm saying, hey, I'm going to shoot you with an x-ray, and you tell me how much it hurts. And then this guy says, oh, it, it hurts, let's just say, from 1 to 10, it hurts at 6. And I use a dose of, let's just say, let's just say, I don't know, I'm, I'm just going to throw arbitrary units, a dose of 20 units. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell this guy, hey, wait a little bit, go relax. And then he comes back and I'm going to tell him, hey, I'm going to shoot you with a brand new radiation I'm testing. I want you to tell me when you get to that level of ouch of 6. So I'm going to start shooting him, and let's just say that he reaches the uh, level, he says, oh, dude, this is exactly, exactly as painful, and I'm at a dose of actually 10 units. That means that this radiation is much more powerful than this radiation, almost by twice. And that, well, or not almost, and that means that this, this D is going to be considerably smaller, which means that my relative biological effectiveness increased. On the other hand, if I need 30 or even 40, 40 units of my absorbed dose to cause the same effectiveness. This, this exponential here is going to be larger, so the relative biological effectiveness is going to be smaller. So the higher my relative biological effectiveness, the more the radiation you can consider it as quality radiation, the more harmful it is going to be. So that is the relative biological effectiveness. And we're going to keep on trucking touch a little bit about cell cycle, and I took this depiction from the Encyclopedia of Science from uh, this, this specific address, and this pertains to cell cycle. Cell cycle. And what do we have in cell cycle? We have the, uh, obviously, the mitosis phase, 
and how the cell starts growing, absorbing nutrients, and the replication of DNA, and preparation for mitosis, and goes back. And we know that there are specific points at which the cell is going to be more sensitive, mainly in my M phase and my G2 phase, the sensitivity for radiation goes up. And I'm going to put this down, radiosensitive, radiosensitive in the M phase and the G2 phase. And when am, I, when am I going to experience the least radio sensitivity in the S phase or mainly at the late, late S phase? And that is also in the minimal, so I'm going to put it here. Least radio sensitive, least radio sensitive in the late S phase. Late S phase. Perfect. So what is, what is differentiation? Differentiation is basically some cells are able to undergo a process that turns them into what we call specialized cell. It's going to give them some sort of purpose. And for that instance, we can think of stem cells, stem cells which are highly undifferentiated. They're, they're not specific. They're not specific. Thus, they are not differentiated. Differentiated. And we can take, let's just say, uh, the odd muscle cell, which is well differentiated, well, well more than a stem cell. It is differentiated. And thus, when we have uh, less differentiation, we're going to experience more uh, radio, radiation sensitivity. So I'm going to write here more radio sensitive. No, you can't really expect the department to ask you to compare between two different cells, which are more differentiated, which are less, because this is effectively something that you're not really introduced to in a, in a basic biophysics course. So don't really, don't really think about it. Just understand that the more differentiation you have, the less radiosensitive you are. Very good. And if you really want example for uh, differentiated uh, or non-differentiated non cells, you can either think of stem cells or uh, what, what, what else do we have? Or you can have zygotes. Very good. Okay, so this is, this is basically the idea. And I've, I've written down some, some, uh, some numbers here that refer to the radiation sensitivity according to, to, um, to cell cycle and differentiation, also taken uh, from the uh, lecture. And just think of it this way. This is the most sensitive, and this is the least sensitive. And it's just going, going up this way. So the further I am up, the more radiosensitive my tissue is. And this often comes up in a test. A true or false question can be nervous tissue or nerve cells are more radiosensitive than lymphatic tissue. False, not true. And it's easy to fall and it be, it's easy to tumble in that way because you're thinking, oh, nervous cells, it, it must be very a complex mechanism going on there. They must be very radiosensitive. So you don't really need to memorize all this. Just think about the uh, white blood cells and lymphatic tissues. Those divide a whole lot. And the muscle tissue and the nervous tissue, it's good to know these two and these two. And then you can probably set yourself up to understanding and scoring the questions that the department may ask you. Very good. Well, we're going to keep on trucking and get to the, uh, to the last ideas that we have. And we're going to touch on fractionation. And fractionation is basically applying the dose of radiation over a period of time that is longer. Let's just say I started irradiating my population here. And then I said, OK, instead of continuing, I'm going to stop for a while and let the single strand DNA break repair itself. I waited a while, and then I'm experiencing another shoulder here. This shoulder basically gives me a break, and, and I'm not experiencing a drop right away. I have a while before I'm going to have my survivability go down. That means that at this, let's just say at this time span, Rather, let's just examine this time span. Without fractionation, I'm only going to have this amount of, uh, of uh, uh, surviving fraction. And with fractionation, I'm going to have almost twice as much. So the more fractionation I have, the less radiosensitive I am. So fractionation helps, helps with radiosensitivity or helps against or a better idea would, would be that the more fractionation I, I apply, 
the less radio sensitive sensitive my tissue will be. And this is kind of a trick idea because my tissue is not more radio sensitive. It's just we're just applying the radiation in fractions and we we allow for the uh, naturally occurring repair mechanisms to take place. So I would actually I would actually fix this and say uh, the less radiation damage, the less radiation damage I may I may observe. Very good. Now metabolism and temperature. It has been observed that when metabolism goes up, the radiation sensitivity goes up as well. And being that temperature, a higher temperature is associated with a higher metabolism. They're somewhat, somewhat one in one in the same. When I have high temperature, I have high metabolism, or whenever I have one of these go up, I would have my radio sensitivity go up. And this is just a, a function of what was observed. And the effect of oxygen is actually pretty easy to understand. Oxygen gives rise to radicals. And there's plenty of radicals that can, that can occur from oxygen. But if I have my target and it's surrounded by, by let's just say these are oxygen, these are oxygen molecules. And it doesn't really have to be molecular gas. It can be any presence of oxygenated tissue. And in that sense, I can, I can actually hit one of these guys here instead of actually getting to my radiation. And this would create, this would create some sort of radical that is very red and angry and is going to interact with my molecule and destroy it. So it is actually very dramatically increasing. So I'm going to write here oxygenated. The more oxygenated my tissue is, the more it is going to be radiosensitive. And this is, this is the radiosensitive. And this is the essence of understanding all these different factors. They actually make sense. The more metabolism, temperature, or the more oxygen I have if I'm in an aqueous solution, or what else did we have here? If I have uh, very strong radiation quality, or uh, if I'm not very differentiated, all of these would, would affect the way that the radiation is absorbed in the tissue. Hopefully you found this helpful. We'll see you in the next video.